Like. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's Digging Deep. I'm here with Tina Archuleta. She's of the Jemez Pueblo and she's the owner of Vitality Plant-Based Foods. And we're so excited because with the holidays coming up, we're gonna talk a little bit about indigenous foods as medicine and nourishment. We'll see you back here in a second. Hey guys, it's so good to see everybody. Happy Wednesday. I'm here with Tina Archuleta. She's coming to us from the Pueblo of Jemez, which is just over there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to let you go ahead and introduce yourself. Great. Well, thank you for having me. My name is Tina Archuleta. I'm the owner of Italiti Plant-Based Foods, and my business um, was created in order to address some of the health disparities we see in Native community. So mm -hmm. that's why I started. That's amazing. I think starting with food as a healing property because it's something you're putting into your body all day every day right and then Absolutely. healing from the inside out totally and as indigenous people we have such a history of um like food warfare totally and i was just talking to someone who raises churro sheep uh navajo guy and he was talking about how like the sheep were killed as a way to take away right. our ability to sustain ourselves yes yes food has always been um a weapon of war um, a tool of war and um we have always been a victim, I think, as Native people. We've been on the uh, receiving end of these um, atrocities that have been used against us um, for centuries and centuries. So what we're trying to do now is just kind of reverse those impacts, address the food trauma, and mm -hmm. fill us up with uh, nurturing, yes. nourishing foods. I love that. I love that. And I thought I wanted you to come in today specifically because we have the holidays ahead right. of us. Mm -hmm. And so we're all going to be eating and we're thinking about food and food is on our minds. Mm -hmm. Also, Indigenous uh, people, Native American Heritage Month. Right. <laughs> Indigenous right. People's Day was a while back. Um, so I thought it would be fun to just kind of get an indigenous perspective right. on food during this sort of feasting time right yeah yeah it's just um it is a feasting time it's harvest time um you know historically this was the time when we all would gather and eat together mm -hmm. and historically it would be traditional foods native foods um gathered foods harvest and today that has morphed into something else it's morphed more into a uh, standard american diet which is a sad diet standard american diet um the acronym is sad diet so it really is sad um and it just depends you know on on how you address that in your own family and what mm -hmm. kind of foods you're putting on the table yeah. um you know when i first became plant-based i had no options on my table for thanksgiving and um you know over time now there's there's a bunch of more side dishes like the green beans, the Brussels sprouts, mashed potatoes, just a bunch of various dishes that I could eat. And that's really exciting that um, my family has also embraced this plant-based way of eating that I have. Are you vegetarian then? I, I am, I would say plant-based. It's more close to vegan. I don't um, necessarily refer to myself as vegan, but mm -hmm. I would say I eat vegan. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So no like wild no, game or? No wild game, no animal products, no dairy, mm. um, no cheese. Oh, that's why you look so great. Oh, like you're glowing. so sweet. <laughs> but yeah, no dairy, no cheese, no eggs, no fish, and um, just everything from plants. Oh gosh, well that does make it hard during the holidays. Yeah, for yeah. Sure. Sometimes I would just, um, you know, kind of just bring my own dish or just yeah. avoid. <laughs> Just avoid the whole situation. Well, let's talk a little bit about what Italiti is. Okay, great. Yeah. Great. So Italiti is, um, it comes from the word Ital, which is a Rasta word for natural, vital. It's a I statement, so it refers back to um, oneself. Cool. So it's Italiti, and it's just, and that's exactly what Ital means, is plant-based foods, no dairy, Mm -hmm. um, no processed foods, no processed meat, processed sugar. So it kind of was very fitting. And I wanted to just kind of pay homage to its roots and that um, plant-based eating is nothing new. It's not, you sure. know, it's a, it's been around in indigenous cultures. Well, as long as for millennia, been, right? as long as plants, <laughs> yeah. And there's some really exciting things happening with vitality. Yes, yes. So in, um, let's see, July of 2021 this past year I signed a lease for a kitchen space located at Avanu Plaza and that is across from the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center on Here 12th Street Albuquerque yes in Albuquerque New Mexico and we're looking at an opening date of um, 
spring 2020 so mm -hmm. yeah please come by check out my plant-based pueblo foods and um so will you be cooking foods there uh, totally i am the owner and chef um so yeah i'll be cooking my plant-based pueblo food and that's just um you know i kind of don't use the word traditional too much but it's a traditional puebloan uh, menu mm -hmm. made plant-based mm. so so what are some things that you'll have on the um, so I have like my Hamas enchiladas oh. without cheese I make my own pumpkin cheese um, oh cool yeah and then I have tamales made with jackfruit or black bean um, uh -huh. various stews atole smoothies and fresh juice Yum. yeah so just a very um just a very, I just want it to be a high frequency feeling for yeah. people. Well, it sounds good just hearing about it. Yeah. And on that note, also, uh, Tina kindly shared one of her recipes with us that we're going to pop. I'm going to put it in the inner circle, our private Great. Facebook group. And I'm going to also have it shared up on the screen here. Great. And it's for blue cornbread. Yes. Blue which corn is one of my cornbread. favorite things. I hope you can try it out. It's a plant-based recipe, um, no eggs. No milk, plant milk, um, and then I use flax, a oh, flax as of the egg, as the egg replacement. Oh, as the egg replacement. Yeah, flax. it can be made gluten free as well. You just have to switch oh, out so the messy. flour. Okay, because that's one of the things I love to make a lot. So I'm excited to try Great. this different Please. take on the cornbread. Yeah. And I when I was pregnant with my daughter last year, I was craving blue corn, and it's just oh. been a thing like I've never stopped wanting to eat it. Yeah. Because once I got started, it just it tastes like of the earth. It's yeah, totally. Amazing. It has a real earthy feeling, mm -hmm. beautiful color. Um, you know, everyone's used to yellow corn, mm -hmm. um, but here in the southwest we really embrace um the blue corn and there's red corns there's oh, purple corn totally I, I would love to make a purple cornbread that would be amazing so yeah there it is there's the recipe um flax flax would be your um binder oh that is so good to know mm -hmm. egg replacement flaxseed awesome yeah sea salt baked maple mm -hmm. syrup yum yeah so there's no sugar in that recipe you can also make it gluten-free if you just switch out the all-purpose flour with um a gluten-free flour and, what i um, find too is um my blue corn meal is so heavy that I have to kind of like put a little less of the blue corn, a little more of right. the white flour sometimes right. to get that nice yeah. fluff. Yeah, as you can see, like the, well, this one is half and half, but um, if you want a little less corn meal, all you have to do is, uh, you know, just some math and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just add, add a half a cup to regular flour and do a half cup less of the blue corn. And I think... Um, that would give you a, a lighter because sometimes blue corn is pretty heavy. Yeah, it can be heavy. It's delicious, but yeah, if you're used to something more fluffy. Yeah. So how did you get into plant-based diet? Um, it was the um at the time I wanted to decolonize my diet. I was um kind of I think I was a senior in high school and I oh, wanted wow. to decolonize my diet. I was like, oh you. Yeah, it was pretty rebellious. Um, and it was through Rastafari and reggae music that is um. I guess um, I guess there's a heavy influence of that in Pueblo communities. And I know a lot, a lot of yeah, Pueblos and so Navajos like, that love reggae. <laughs> yeah, so I kind of grew up with that influence. And the more I listened to the sound, you know, I, I kind of heard what they were talking about. And it was about food and an uh, Aital way of living, a natural way of living. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted that for myself. I wanted to change how I felt, change how I was thinking, just um, kind of take my own wellness into my own hands and mm. that's what I did I just stopped eating fast food I think that was the first kind of step it was like no fast food and it had to be a line in the sand almost it was like this is what I yeah, eat and this is what I be, don't right? eat because it's like yes, everywhere it's, always yeah and it's hard you know it's hard but once I drew that line it was like I don't eat that and I stayed away from fast food stayed away from processed meat and I just got better and better at it. Wow. So it's been 16 years. That's amazing. Yeah, so that's, um, that's goals right there. And I love that you said that you were rebellious because you don't often think about what you eat as being a form of rebellion. Oh yeah. But like as an indigenous person and having those colonial diets yes. forced on you mm -hmm. often against your will. Absolutely. As, ancestrally speaking. Totally. I often say that food is frontline. Like what you I put on that. your plate is the front line and, um, you know, what you spend your money on, who you're putting, who you're supporting mm -hmm. matters. And that was a big thing for me in my journey. It was like, you know, um, McDonald's is like, doesn't support me. They don't care about me. They don't care about native culture, native health. 
why should I support them? So yeah. it was just kind of addressing those questions that I had for myself. And it's a great way to look at it. Yeah, and I just, you know, I only want food that is supporting Native culture and Native people and the the well-being and the healing of our of our whole culture. So I, I really feel like healthy eating is preservation of culture. It's kind mm -hmm. of, you know, some of my friends tell me like, don't get all militant on people. And but it's I hard to separate. <laughs> Yeah, separate it out. I mean, I think I've always heard like being a native person or indigenous person, you're inherently political, whether you want to be or not, exactly. because you're just a product of a political environment. Exactly. And it, it attaches itself to so many different things, right? Including what's going on in the garden, because that's exactly. land based and everything like that. Yeah. I'm so excited. I, I, I keep just wanting to talk about what's happening up here. <laughs> yeah, so this is like a great example. You know, some people refer to where we live as a, um, or, or the situation we're in, some people refer to it as a food desert, whereas um, these foods come from the desert. So what we have here, what I brought to share with you today. So close up on, the, on this one. Here. Great. Yeah, so that right there is a prickly pear fruit. So the tuna. So I gathered this and I dried it. And um, I was inspired to do so um, from Roxanne Swensel. Yeah. From OK Owinge. Yes. She's my... The food project. The na what yeah, is it? The um, Pueblo Food Project? Yes. The Pueblo Food Project and Pueblo Food Experience. That's I'm it. Sorry. That's it. And um, yeah, I went to her house one time. I was with Rose and I went over and she had this huge jar of prickly pear powder. And Ooh. I'd never seen that before. And I was just, I was just so... Um, just captivated so this past season I went out I gathered specifically to dry and I just cut them I peeled mm. them cut them in half put them to dry and then I was able to grind them on the grinding stone into a fine powder what do you do with the powder so what I would do with the powder is rehydrate it so it's like making a tea um, okay they're Therefore, you're able to preserve the prickly pear fruit into the winter season, into mm -hmm. spring, um, and able to have that tea and have that medicine. Um, can you, you, can I eat it? Yeah, it, yeah, totally. You can totally I'm, eat a I'm piece. I'm guessing there's probably a lot of vitamin C in here. Yes, high vitamin C. There's, those are seeds in the middle, so you don't want to eat those, but. Oh, I don't? <laughs> I mean, you can spit oh, them out. fine. But um, when you dry. It's tasty. Yeah, it's it, sweet. It becomes concentrated, the sweetness. It almost has a chili flavor too. Yummy. Like it tastes like a little bit of red chili mm. and like sweetness. Yeah. Yeah, it has like a bitter, it has a bitter and a sweet. Um, mm -hmm. So. I love it. Yeah, I would just grind it to a fine powder and then uh, make it as a tea. And it's really, really good. It's really beautiful. It has a really deep, dark color. And then what else I brought for you today was um, something I made this past season was sumac sugar. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can give you a better look at that. I love this because I know a lot of people have prickly pears in their yards here in Albuquerque right. and in New Mexico. And I like have a friend who makes prickly pear margaritas and like a syrup with it. Yes. But nobody really talks about like where you go past the margarita. Exactly. <laughs> um, people kind of just um, kind of glorify it in the season. You know, it's like fresh fruit, or or people would make jelly. Mm -hmm. uh, we see a lot of jellies. We see a lot of prickly pear candy. Um, and so this is sumac sugar. That is sumac sugar. So what I did for this was I went out and I gathered three leaf sumac berries. I'm gonna try it. Please do so. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's a um, no way. So if you've tried three leaf sumac, <gasps> it tastes kind of similar to lemonade, like mm -hmm. a lemonade taste has a sour taste, so I just infuse the sugar with the sumacs, um, sumac berries, and then dry wow. it. This is amazing. Hold on, you have to try some later. Yes, they taste like... When your daughter... So, um, Tina's daughter is here, yes. and when she mentioned the sumac sugar, she goes, mmm, and now I understand why. Yeah. It's like candy. I want to hear what you think it tastes like before. Well, I I'm familiar with the sumac berry. Mm-hmm. So I taste those um, current, it's like a currenty, tangy flavor. And then it, maybe like a raw sugar. Yeah, yeah, it's so raw it's sugar. It's kind of crystallized. Mm -hmm. But it's that little bit of tang that makes it, like you just want to keep eating it. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of Sour Patch Kids. 
Oh, okay. Like a candy, like a... Some, I've heard somebody say that before about the sumac berries. Yeah, it kind of has like a sweet, sour... Mm-hmm. That's the perfect combination. A subtle, sweet, but yeah. Sour. So this I would use um, just to sweeten um, a lemonade. Mm-hmm. Just a quick drink or just... I just honestly, I just eat it like this sometimes here and there. Oh, yeah. Um, so as a treat. I was too busy enjoying the flavor and I wasn't paying attention. Like a bad interviewer. No, no, no. <laughs> How did you say that you cr created this? I gathered this sumac berries and I just infused the sugar. Oh. Um, I pulsed it um, in a food processor a few times and just kind of broke up the berries. Oh, okay. And so it's it's raw sugar that's infused with the sumac. Yes. Oh, okay. I was thinking yeah. somehow you drew like nectar out of the sumac, I but mean, I get it now. So the sugar is what would draw the nectar out. It kind oh. of it gives the the flavor somewhere to be. It's a host. So okay, you could, that makes sense. Yeah, you could make sumac salt if you wanted. Um, oh, I bet that would be good. Yeah, you just kind of need a host. And the sugar is a good host for this particular oh, berry. So did you teach yourself a lot of this? I bet in the yeah. Pueblo there's a lot of ancestral knowledge too. Um, yeah, there is ancestral knowledge. Um, in today's time, there's not too many people out there um, kind of, you know, doing these types of things and moving in these food ways. Um, and that's what I'm just kind of stepping into. So I don't mm -hmm. really have a teacher. I kind of gather information from where I can. Like this whole process was um, inspired from Roxanne Swenzel. Mm -hmm. And um, so just little bits of pieces um, of information, you know, anywhere I can get them. I think I learned this from the Black Forager. She is a black woman. Um, who forages food and they have a different sumac uh, variation where she's from but uh -huh. the process was the same it's still there yeah so it's like just learning the processes and um you know just manifesting them and if you think about it um, i just before you move on like a lot of the processes of our ancestors were simple we, okay. we don't have to overthink it you know it was like fairly simple techniques it was drying um, you know, boiling. There was there wasn't too many. Well, and in here in the southwest, because sun and we can't freeze things, right? Right. So everything is dehydrated. Yes, yes. So everything would have been dehydrated for preservation. Mm. And um, but it's an amazing way to be able to um, have prickly pear in the winter or and throughout traditionally the you would need that vitamin C in the winter too. Yes, yes. We, um, I think our body is, if I'm correct, our body doesn't produce vitamin C. We have to get it from a plant source. I think that's right. Because like yes. sailors on ships would like get scurvy. Scurvy. Yeah. Because yeah, they didn't have vitamin C. Yeah. <laughs> so what are some other, like, what's your kitchen like at home? What are some things like this that we might find that you wouldn't find in like a traditional Western kitchen? Um, I have my... Western American kitchen. <laughs> I have a lot of these type of jars around and they, um, they serve as cups and... Just, so I have a lot of these jars. Um, I love me some mason jars. Totally. And I have a grinding stone that was my great grandmother's mm. to grind up these things. I have coffee grinder, um, food dehydrator. Just um, those are mainly the things I have. That, and like that ingredients. Do you, have, do you do any foraging? Um, I am stepping into it. This is kind of my products of my foraging. Um, mm. And in season, you know, I've gathered um, spearmint up mm -hmm. in the Hamas Mountains along the river, mm -hmm. raspberry leaf tea. Mm. I have that. Um, and that's really nice. I have nettle mm -hmm. from the Hamas Mountains as well. And just, um, yeah, kind of stepping out as I need those, I would bring them in. But I'm surrounded in the high desert. I'm just surrounded by food and did you know that New Mexico has the highest biodiversity of any state in the country? Amazing. I'm not surprised. Yeah, there's just hundreds amazing. and hundreds of species. Because there's not, it hasn't been plowed down for farmland or whatever. So there's, right. And we also have like the high mountains all right. the way to the, like the Sonoran Valley. Desert. Yeah, yeah. The val river valleys. Yeah, so we have a lot of different um, plant zones and that's... that's uh, here's an example even. I think, or I think these are fairly from the same zone. But um, like the red raspberry leaf, it wouldn't be found in this zone. It's mm -hmm. found in the, um, I think it's called like pine zone. Yeah, up a little higher. Ponderosa pine zone. Yeah, so um, 
kind of I'm in between so I have you know the capabilities to fluctuate from the mountain plants to the valley plants and I just love that so I'm you know trying to develop my calendar my my seasonal like native food calendar and you know when you're I feel like you need to make an app Yes. Native food calendar oh, app. Yes. Wouldn't that be awesome? That would be amazing. If we have any app people out there watching, please <laughs> contact us. <laughs> oh, speaking of, we need to pop your Instagram in there. So everybody, oh, yes. please follow, please follow Tina. Not only is she a wealth of knowledge and talent, she's also an entrepreneur, an indigenous female entrepreneur, which is a person close to my heart because I'm one as well. So be sure and support her. It's IT. Wait, you better spell it. I T A L I T Y Italiti N M underscore. Oh yes, underscore right. N M. That was my website. <laughs> That's my Instagram. Yes, perfect. Yeah, so go follow her. Um, and so thinking about the holidays that are coming up and the feast times, what mm -hmm. I know we had our cornbread uh, recipe up there for okay. everybody, but what are some other ways that people can start indigenizing their kitchens? Um, I mean, because you all, we're all, everyone I, here in the Americas are on indigenous land, right. so there's got to be some plants out there. That... Uh, you know, I think we could all start by acknowledging what indigenous foods are, because the table at Thanksgiving is fairly indigenous. Um, you know, That's true. we have pumpkin, mm. corn, and um, it, just depending on what other kind of dishes you have, even well, potatoes. And the turkey. And turkey <laughs> is all from the Americas. Yeah. It's all native to America, so I think... It, um, families could just maybe open that conversation of food origin because mm -hmm. um, I think that's really important and kind of gets overlooked. You know, we look at um, Italian food and we think of pizza and pasta, and yeah, but we don't think um, native food when we think of Italian food from the tomato, right? So True. just acknowledging yeah. like the origin of these ingredients I think could be very helpful to global conversation and or national conversation. Absolutely. And I think uh, what I've been told by farmers is that a lot of those hard conversations are so much easier to have in the garden because you're connecting to something that is so basically human, like so integral to being a human being. And the same with food. And right. Right. I mean, I love pumpkin. You love pumpkin. Guess where <laughs> pumpkin comes from? It's an indigenous <laughs> food from the Americas. Right. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm sure pumpkin pie is a, had an indigenous origins. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So. And there's actually, and I have the app, um, and I encourage everybody to check out. There's an app where wherever you are, you oh, can yes. see what indigenous lands you are on. It's just called native land. Watch, I'll show the little right here. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great one. Native land. It's like, we can just do it right now and see what it says. So cool. So it shows us over here. There's just a little. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to zoom in. My daughter broke the screen on my phone. So we're on Tiwa land that you can see there. So this is just a really cool resource. If you're curious what uh, native land that you happen to be on, and then from there you can, you know, maybe start asking questions or doing some research on like what did the people of this land eat traditionally. Yeah, that would be great. And most plants, I'm told, are edible. Like a lot, of, and yeah, look at like what, lot. they might not taste good, but they're not going <laughs> to kill you. Yeah, and it's a lot to do with our taste bud receptors and how, yeah. use, how used to those we are because we can recalibrate our taste buds, you know. Um, we can train ourselves to like more and more bitter foods. At first, it might be so off, but right. that's because we're used to sweets or, you Absolutely. know, salt. Well, I have a one-year-old, and I, I'm watching her do that. Oh, where she's yeah. like developing her palate and like yeah. learning. I'm feeding her in food from India, and yeah. food from, food so from Vietnam, and she's <laughs> just like absorbing all of it. Yeah, that's amazing. So she's just developing her palate, and yeah. because you're doing so, she's gonna, you know, have a, a adventurous wide, palate. Yeah, she's gonna have a I lot to so. choose from. Well, her mother's a, or her grandmother's a chef. My mom, so Great. so it's like my obligation. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, for our daughters, um, when they were young. When they were babies, my partner, he's a nutritionist, um, and um, he recommended we didn't start with sweets. We'd start mm -hmm. with bitters. He was so intent oh. on giving her bitters Interesting. first so that she wouldn't um, prefer sweets alone. 
That's um, smart. Yeah. yeah. Cause yeah. you'll usually start with like the bananas and yeah. the <laughs> apples and mm-hmm. Guilty. peaches. Guilty. I, t- I was too. I was, I did that too. Um, but, um, yeah, her father was like, no, let's give her bitter foods and, and bitter is better. Right. So bitter foods are really important to us. There's some bitter foods. I'm not even, I'm drawing a blank. Like oh, there's just spinach, like spinach maybe. No, that's not yeah, really. Yeah. I mean, it could be a soft bitter, um, kale would be considered kale. a bitter food. Just like something really, um, Intense. Yeah. It gets like your mouth goes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even as far as herbs, bitters, like this has a bitter taste, but it has a sweet, um, and osha, bitter, bitter root, um, mm-hmm. carrot, um, carrot, the greens on carrots. Yeah. I'm not sure what that's called, but <laughs> carrot greens. Carrot greens. <laughs> yeah. So like stuff like that's really bitter, but bitter is supposed to be so good for you. Interesting. Good. Yeah. Let's. Well, does anybody out there watching have any questions? Um, yeah, we're totally open to questions. Um, and so be sure, so January is the opening date, did you say, or February? Um, spring of 2020. Spring, okay. I, I'm thinking, I'm having like, um, I'm giving like a bunch of estimate dates, um, but I'm looking at spring 2020. That'll be exciting. Yeah, there will be a lot of... Um, Foods out there. Yeah, a lot of plants coming yeah, up. It's pre- so I'm sure you grow a big garden too. Yeah, we have a, a family garden every year, uh, and then in Hamas, my family has a large field every year. Um, with chili, Malayan corns, mm. um, and yeah, I kind of have a small garden. I live a little closer to the mountains mm-hmm. and um, in a canyon, so we have to deal with the sun. I have to tell you that when I came to see you a few mm-hmm. weeks ago, driving back through Amos, all of those porches full of the red chili ristras it's amazing. was just breathtaking i was driving like oh my gosh it's amazing and it'll be like you know 40 ristras or 30 ristras it's amazing this is a good question someone's asking how do you tell the difference between poisonous and non-poisonous sumac um i'm not familiar with poisonous sumacs outside of this region um i'm familiar with three leaf sumac so that would be something that you have to research on your own so you can refer to the leaves um to identify the plant so i have an app for this great oh yeah like leaf a plant snap. identifier leaf snap right there i feel like i'm like doing an ad promotion show but <laughs> leaf snap is amazing because you can take a picture of the plant and it'll tell you what it is exactly so just kind of look but, at the leaves but i'll yeah go ahead. I'm, I'm in, i don't want to like accidentally get someone poisoned but like if the birds are eating the berries it's a pretty good indication that it's not poisonous right it could be totally, um, and they. Um, so I know here the bear, the birds love the red, the sumac berries, mm-hmm. the three leaf sumac berries. Oh yeah, they do. And if like anything, you want to test it out on yourself first before um, consuming a large amount. Just make sure you know you're not having a, a reaction of any sort. But this is three leaf sumac, and it has been. Let me see if I can pull up a picture of it. Historically, um, mm-hmm. has been a Puebloan food, so I kind of three um, leaf trust that this sumac. is edible. But yeah, I'm not familiar with what type of sumac you may have. The three leaf, right? Yes, that's three leaf sumac. This is, and you can eat the little berries, and they have a seed in the middle of them, but they taste like Sour Patch Kids. They're sweet and sour. Yeah. I grew up munching on them. And there's, like, you might have, like, staghorn sumac. Um, Oh, good to know, Sandy. That's why I was like, I don't (laughs) know if I should be saying this or not. Yeah. Yes. Definitely do your research before you just start going out and eating plants. Yeah. Like, we're not trying to get anybody poisoned. Yeah. yeah, like I don't know the plants in your region. But there's also like really good books too, like medicinal Absolutely. plant books that are regional. I have one by Michael Moore, I think is, or somebody nice. more. I oh, gosh, I can't remember. Yeah, and there's so. more and more foragers mm-hmm. creating books for people out there. Absolutely. Um, so I just kind of follow them. And uh, like I said earlier, this the lady from I think she might have been in the east as well. She had a, a different sumac, and what I learned from that is just how to process the sumac in what we have here, which is a smaller berry as as you showed. Um, I think in the but east. But you can coast, use that process with any fruit. Any fruit, exactly. So. Um, and so you just. Do you cut up the fruit and put it in the sugar? Or? I put it with the sugar and process it oh, together. Process it. Yeah, and then you dry it, and then you sift out the... The pulp. um, Yeah, kind of like the seed. Mm, Okay. The seeds. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that question. Yeah, it was a good question. (laughs) And thank you for that confirmation, Sandy. Yes, absolutely. Um, Well, 
I think that, is there anything that you wanted to tell us or share with us before um, we wrap up? You know, I just wanted to say that I'm looking forward to incorporating more forage indigenous foods into my my Puebloan menu that I've created to have available at my restaurant. So, um, you know, I just, it's, a, it's a just about getting out there, getting these ingredients and incorporating them and giving people the opportunity to try them. So I look forward to anyone out there coming to my location and someday you'd be able to try this sumac sugar um, for yourself. Fabulous. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And this is, uh, again, our Digging Deep show. We do this every other Wednesday. We're going to be taking a break through December and then picking back up again in January. But the Digging Deep show is uh, brought to you by, if you will, our not the T Skies nonprofit, the T Skies Jewelers Co-op. If you want to pop that information in there, and that's a really sweet um, nonprofit that the Turquoise Skies does, where we raise money for Indigenous students pursuing a bench jewelry program at CNM. So if you're not familiar with that part of what we do here, please be sure and check that out. There will be some information there in the comments on that. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. And I hope you all have happy holidays and stay safe and be well and um, be kind to people out there this holiday season, especially retail workers. <laughs> Mwah. Great. Thanks for having me. Bye. Mm -hmm.